everybody. My name is Soumya Mandava, and welcome to the What the Health podcast, brought to you by the Alumni Association in conjunction with the Renaissance School of Medicine. Each episode, we bring on an outstanding alumnus who tells us what the health we can expect after graduating from medical school. From their journey to their interest to incorporating it into their chosen fields, we get to hear it all. So let's jump right in. everyone and welcome back. This is Somia and today's episode we have the distinct pleasure of talking with Dr. Tara Allman, a board certified gynecologist, author of Menopause Confidential, and alum from class of 1990. How are you today Dr. Allman? I'm great. I'm so excited to be speaking to all the students so let's get started. And we're so happy to have you here with us today, and we're looking forward to getting to know you more. To start us off, could you please tell us a little bit about yourself? I am born and raised on the small island of Manhattan. <laughs> so I'm kind of a, I'm a, I'm a local. Uh, I did my residency. I, I, I love, by the way, being a student at Stony Brook, and I'll be happy to share that story as well. But I did my residency in San Francisco and I just loved New York so much. I flew all the way back to San Francisco and decided to start my practice here. But basically I'm a New York City girl and I grew up to be a gynecologist. That's my story. Could you tell us a little bit more about that, about what led you to a residency in OB-GYN? Well, I loved my rotation at Stony Brook as a third year and It's just a very natural place for women to feel comfortable. But the truth of the matter is that I really loved GYN oncology. That was the thing that got me most excited. It was the surgery, the cases were really hard, the patients were really sick. And I don't know, something about that was very interesting to me. So in order to become a GYN oncologist, you have to do an obstetrics and gynecology residency. So that's really how I got there. It was absolutely not my goal to be an obstetrician gynecologist. (laughs) That definitely makes sense. I can hear and see a lot of the excitement and passion you have for gynecology. And previously we discussed a little bit about gyn-onc. Is that the fellowship that you pursued after your OB-GYN residency or did you go along a different pathway? So after I did my OBGYN residency at UC San Francisco, and I want all of the listeners, all the students to be motivated to shoot for programs that are far away from where you are, because you learn so many different things when you learn at a different place than your New York or wherever you're from. Really, uh, things are done differently in other places. And it was so great to see that and train in California. And I was exhausted at the end of a four-year OBGYN residency, and the thought of maybe doing a three-year fellowship in GYN oncology after that, I just couldn't fathom it. So I decided to stick with OBGYN. I got a job immediately in private practice where they offered me a lot of money, and I want your students to know that. That was a motivating factor. It was in San Francisco, And it was the first real money I'd ever made in my whole life. And that was a great experience. And uh, at some point, I made a decision like all of you will one day, where I want to make my home, my family, where was I supposed to land and stick the landing? And I decided it was New York City where I'm born and raised. And so I got a job through a recruiter to go into private practice in New York City. And I did that a couple of years, but there was something inside of me that really was very interested in midlife women's health. And for all the students listening, that's really an aspect of OBGYN that's not really well taught. It doesn't make as much money as the obstetrics part or the GYN surgery part. But it's where I felt happiest. This is the care of women, let's say, over the age of 40 as they begin their journey toward menopause. So it's perimenopause into menopause and beyond. And it just was so, I don't know why, something, I was an early 30-something 
And uh, I really wanted to be a part of this world, to take care of these women who didn't get a lecture on any aspect of this part of women's health. So we teach young women, adolescent women, 20 something women, 30 something, we teach them a lot of stuff. And then when they become 40 year olds, we stop teaching them things. And they all show up to perimenopause and menopause utterly clueless. And that's where I want it to be. So I, again, uh, asked around to see if there was any kind of position and I pivoted from my very lucrative OBGYN practice to, <laughs> to a spot at a center for menopause that was connected to Columbia where I didn't make any money at all. But really I want your students and listeners and anyone to know I found my purpose. And that's going to be an overriding theme when you're trying to figure out what specialty do you want to pursue? What aspect within that specialty resonates the most with you. And when you do that, when you find what makes your heart sing, it's not work anymore. Now it's, it's pleasure. And you're so excited to be whatever it is you choose. I really am thrilled to be a gynecologist who focuses on midlife women's health. I feel like I have the best job in the world. It is the most fulfilling career I could ever have asked for. And uh, that's what I hope that you'll all take away when you're trying to figure these things out for yourself. Definitely. I think you're a fantastic example for us of how we can find job opportunities and success when we follow what our passions and dreams are. So thank you so much for sharing that. And in terms of your specialty, this is actually one of my first introductions to midlife women's health. So could you tell us a little bit more about that? The types of patients you're able to help, the settings in which you practice and so on? Well, I really kept to the private practice theme. It sort of worked for my personality. And after I joined the Center for Menopause, I branched out on my own in the beginning. And I was told, I'm not sure if you can even do this model anymore. I might be a dinosaur, but I was told by my colleague that they didn't accept insurance. I think that flies maybe in Manhattan, but might not fly all over the place. So I said, okay, I won't either. And when you don't accept insurance, and it's really an office-based kind of practice, you really have to build your practice one patient at a time because they're not coming to you with their insurance. And that may be one of the reasons why I, after 25 years, 30 years doing it this way, that I have a very successful practice. I built it one patient at a time and they told two friends. So I have a private practice that I literally built one patient at a time. I see women over the age of 40 until through their 70s, 80s, and everything is on the table when you are no longer making babies. This is the care of non-pregnant women. And specifically with perimenopause and menopause, there are a lot of symptoms and issues and health concerns that come into women's lives that uh, they don't get an education about, which includes breast cancer, heart disease, osteoporosis, cognitive health, sexual health, uh, everything health over the age of 40 is basically what I take on. And it's really, it's complicated. It's different every day. And it really requires your focus to be on this group of women. It's really hard to be a generalist. You can't deliver babies and do GYN surgery and take care of menopausal women and do it all well. So uh, I, I, do all, I do what I do be, and I'm so joyful about it because I just focus on this group. So it's basically a private practice built woman by woman over 30 years. That is so amazing how you're able to build your practice like that. And in addition to the clinical work that you're doing in the field, you're also an expert because of the book that you wrote, Menopause Confidential. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, that's a fun story. I uh, Not only am I a doctor in real life, but sometimes I play one on TV. And I was always invited to talk on television about women's issues. And I was invited by Dr. Oz to talk about perimenopause. This is a few years ago. And one of the people who saw that episode was a literary agent from San Francisco who just emailed me out of the blue and said, I think you should write a book. And I, this is another uh, good point for everybody on listening to this podcast. I had never written anything in my whole life besides a letter. 
but I was just around the tender age of turning 50 and I thought, okay, I'll write a book. <laughs> so that's actually how it happened. The literary agent contacted me. It was not on my bucket list to do. I am an expert in the field. And I literally sat at my kitchen counter over nine months, which is very poetic when you're an OBGYN, <laughs> nine months and my baby, Menopause Confidential, was born. And that is really the gift that keeps on giving. That book has helped thousands of women all across the land and my own patients. And I hear from women actually all over the world uh, who've read the book and have reached out to me. So that's an aspect of my practice and my professional life that is a gift to me that I can continue to help women, not just one woman at a time, but all across the land, all across the world. It's one of the most fun, fulfilling things that I've experienced. Writing the book was a terrible experience. <laughs> For those of you who are thinking, I can't do it, I, I agree, it's really hard. It's much more to be a doctor than to write a book. But now that I did it, uh, I, I recommend it when you're at that stage in your life, if you feel really passionate about something, try new things, try anything. What I'm saying is you, you're not just going to be this in your career. As you grow and evolve, you're, you're going to pivot this way or that, depending on where your interest takes you. And it sounds like your interests have taken you on such a fascinating journey over the years. What would you say has been your favorite part of your career so far? Well, I really am one of those doctors who's really so thrilled to be a doctor. And in fact, when I come home from a day at my office, I say to my teenagers, I had the best day. I love being a doctor. And it's because I choose to, I choose, I chose what I wanted to do. I'm re I work really hard for what I have. I find it so fulfilling. So there's not one thing. I just love every aspect about it. I just can't say enough great things about how great you feel at the end of a day when you know you have changed someone else's life for the better. It's just built in uh, self-satisfaction, right? As young training doctors, I know we put our gratification on delay for med school and pre-med before that and residency is no picnic. And early doctoring is difficult too, but at some certain point you will get to where I am, where you are, you are mastered your art of medicine. There's an art as well as the science. You have mastered it and you'll just really enjoy it. And that I just really enjoy all aspects of it. There's nothing I don't enjoy. There's not one thing. I love to hear that. Throughout this talk, you've given us so much great advice. Is there anything else that you would like to share with our medical students about their journey ahead? Yes, I would like the medical students, when it's match day, uh, when it's match or when it's time to apply, I really do, uh, if, you're, if we're a New York-based medical school, I really want you to shoot for areas that are, you, that are far away from where you think you might want to land. That's one piece of advice that really worked for me. I went as far away from New York as possible. I chose a city I wanted to live in, San Francisco. And uh, you know, it really opened my eyes to the way that things are done. Not everything is done the way we do that, do it here in New York. I will also say that if you know for sure you want to get a job in Boston, I'm just making it up, sometimes it helps also to shoot for your residency in Boston if you know 100% that's where you want to land because it does help to make connections during your training with other doctors when you're going into uh, to get a job and maybe stick the landing in that same town. So I guess that isn't that conflicting advice? I'm saying shoot for far away from where you want to land. I didn't know I wanted to land back in New York though. Uh, and I think that what I'm saying is that my, my experience training in another really opened up my mind and my eyes to the fact that things are done very differently all over the street. So again, if you know where you want to land, maybe that's where you should try to match so that you can have an easier time getting a position. And if you don't know where you want to land, really, really go for it. Really go to a, go to a city you want to live in, uh, you know, just really try 
and and here's what I'd like the med students, all of you to know, it's really all gonna work out in the end. It's a really, really hard journey. You wanna quit all the time. We all do, we all did. Uh, but there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Really, there is. And it really, I can't think of a better job career than being a physician. I really cannot. Truly, thank you so, so much, Dr. Allman, for your time and for all of the fantastic advice that you shared. It's my pleasure. Go Renaissance School of Medicine. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for tuning in to What the Health. Be sure to check out the linked resources and materials at the Stony Brook Medicine channel on YouTube. See you next time.